This is a Bugatti Chiron, and it is currently the fastest production car you can buy. It'll do 261 miles per hour. It's also the most powerful production car you can buy. Back here is an 8-liter quad-turbocharged 16-cylinder engine that makes 1,500 horsepower. It's also the most expensive new production car you can buy. The base price of this car is just a shade under $3 million. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of it. Now, I've borrowed this Chiron from Bugatti, who's pretty much the only people crazy enough to let me drive it. But this was organized by Grand Touring Autos here in Toronto, in Ontario, Canada. Grand Touring Autos is the Bugatti dealer here in Toronto, and they also have a few other exotic brands, Lamborghini, Bentley, Rolls Royce, etc. And they're opening a new location, and so Bugatti lent them this car to have on display for the grand opening. But that's tomorrow. Today, I drive it. And I sincerely hope I don't crash it. Anyway, let's get to all the important stuff. Bugatti, as you probably know, has a history of making sports cars and race cars that goes back over a century. Volkswagen bought them about 20 years ago and eventually released the Veyron, which was the fastest car on Earth at the time. But the original Veyron had only a thousand horsepower and it could only do 253 miles an hour, two numbers that simply had to be bested. And so there's this. The Chiron has 1,500 horsepower, which, to be clear, is six Honda S2000s. The base price is $2.998 million before options, which are surely plentiful and extravagant. The Chiron is also the fastest production car in the world available right now. It'll do 260 miles an hour, although it's not quite as fast as the world record edition of the Veyron, which was its predecessor. That could hit almost 270. Not that anyone will ever do that speed, of course, but you could. Anyway, today I'm going to take you on a tour of the Chiron. I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and features, which are plentiful. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Chiron, click the link below to visit autotrader.com oversteer, where I've compiled a list of the most expensive cars currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now I'm going to start in front with the grill, which is a very distinctive shape. They call it a horseshoe-shaped grill, and it has been a characteristic shape on Bugattis going back to the start of time. My favorite Bugatti that used it was the EB110, which had a totally different front end that didn't really work with the grill, and yet they incorporated it anyway because Bugattis must have this grill. Another thing I like up front is the LEDs and the headlights. The design of them, the look of them, is very cool with these four little squares on each side side. It has a very nice look. These are just the regular running lights. If you're wondering why the lights are flickering, it's due to the frame rate of the camera. The lights actually look solid when you look at them in person. They don't actually flicker when you see this car on the street. Now, when you turn on the headlights, they come on in the middle of the outer two running lights. Turn on the brights, and they turn on in between the inner two running lights. But my favorite is the turn signals, which appear as four light strips below the LED running lights, which is a really cool look. We aren't done with the front of the Chiron yet. Another interesting item with the headlights is the welcome lights. When you have the key in your pocket and you approach the Chiron, the LEDs turn on. And they don't just turn on, they turn on in sort of a pattern to welcome you to your Bugatti experience. The welcome lights are also a little hard to see due to the camera frame rate, but basically as you approach the car, they first light up one at a time at half brightness from the outside going in to the grill in the center, and then they light up at full brightness going the opposite direction, which is really cool. Also cool with the headlights, on the inside of the headlights you can see that there is a little duct there. What does that duct do? Well, it cools the brakes. That's right, there is a channel from the headlights to the brakes in this car, and it keeps the brakes cool to allow them to provide maximum stopping power. Another cool channel you'll see in the front in the Chiron is down here in the bumper, and you can tell this channel doesn't really go to anything. It sort of starts in the front and ends right on the inside of the wheel arch. It turns out that's functional. That's actually designed to send air in a very specific place to minimize turbulence on the side of the car to make it just a little bit slipperier so the 
car can achieve better acceleration and high speeds. Speaking of brake cooling, the front brakes in this car are 16 and a half inches, which is just massive. That's a pretty good wheel size for most cars, and in this car, it's the brakes. So you can see why they would need to be cool. But back to the grill for a minute. Next, I want to discuss the Bugatti emblem. Now, as you can see, the Bugatti emblem is front and center in the grill, and Bugatti says that this is the one part of the car that they made unnecessarily heavy when it didn't have to be. That's because the Bugatti emblem is made of silver. But of course it is. It really sort of drives home the luxury car point. And next up we move on to the trunk, which is up front. Now there are a couple of interesting things about the trunk, starting with the trunk lid itself. Take a look at the design of this trunk lid. It sort of looks like the Batman logo. It's a very cool piece when it's opened. It's a very nice look. Now on top of the trunk lid, you can see this car is finished in this blue carbon finish, and the Bugatti people told me it meets in the center in this perfect 45 degree angle, and they accept nothing less. That's the sort of perfection you demand when you're charging three million dollars for a vehicle. And next up we move on to the trunk itself. Now opening the trunk is done just like a lot of other sports cars. You pull a little latch in the driver's foot well, that brings it to this position. Then there's a little latch under here, you pull it, and it opens right up. And there are a couple of interesting things you'll find once you get under here. The first of which is there's this big black metal divider in the trunk. Now I asked the Bugatti people about that and they told me that the rule is in the North American market if your trunk is a certain uninterrupted volume then you are required by law to put one of those interior trunk handles inside the trunk so if someone gets stuck or locked in your trunk then you can get out. Bugatti didn't want to add one of those interior trunk handles just for the North American market so they added this divider to split the trunk in half, which decreased the total uninterrupted trunk volume just enough so they could avoid this regulation. And that is why only the North American Chiron models have this divider in them. Now, a couple of other interesting things you will find in the trunk of this car. One is the overall size. Bugatti says it is sized to store a carry-on bag for an airplane. Obviously, the North American version with the divider in it is a little bit hampered for size because the divider sort of bisects the trunk, but nonetheless, that was the original design specification. Now, another interesting item in the trunk you will see over on the right side of the trunk, there's a little sort of piece of luggage that's strapped in there, Alcantara. That holds the tire inflator kit. This car obviously doesn't have enough room for a full-size spare tire, so instead you unzip that and you get the tire inflator kit, and it is designed to fit perfectly on the side of your trunk. Also, a couple of other interesting items inside the trunk, one of which is right above the tire inflator kit. It's a little plaque that is printed for every Chiron, and it says Bugatti, and it says where it's built, and it says one of five. 500, which, by the way, is the production run of this vehicle. Bugatti says they're only going to build 500 of these for the entire world. The other interesting label inside the trunk is the one that says, warning, temperature inside the trunk may exceed 122 degrees, which is 50 degrees Celsius. Just letting you know if you put something in there, it might get hot. Next, we move on to the side of the Chiron, where you can see that the most visually obvious and interesting item is this silver sweeping line that sort of goes along the entire side of the car. They call this the Bugatti line, or the C line, since it's shaped like a C. Now, it's a very beautiful piece, but it's also functional. The line sort of separates the rear fender from the rest of the car in back, which allows a lot of air to come in back there in order to cool the engine, which is obviously important for an engine this large. A couple of interesting things about the Bugatti line. One is that it's this giant, unbroken piece of aluminum that starts all the way down here and finishes all the way back there. It is absolutely massive. One other interesting item on the side of the car, you can see that right behind the front window, behind the door, you have the fuel door. You just tap it and it opens right up and then you can see, well, actually it isn't the fuel door at all. Instead, that's where you put in oil into the engine. The fuel door is on the other side, the exact same size and shape, and you open it the exact same way, but that one has a picture of a little gas pump on it, as opposed to the little oil lamp on the other side. Next, we move on to the back of the Chiron, where there are a couple of interesting items worth mentioning. I'm going to start with the engine itself. You can see that printed on the engine, it says W16 on one side and 1500 on the other side, representative of how many horsepower this car has. Also, you can see the two Bugatti logos printed there on the engine. That's kind of a cool little touch. One interesting item about the engine, though, is it can't be accessed. You cannot actually open this to get into the engine, so you can't tinker on your Chiron by yourself, which frankly is probably a good thing. That's why the oil cap is over there on the side looking like 
with the fuel cap, so if you want to add oil, you can do it through there. Otherwise, the engine is best to be left to the professionals. One other interesting item in the vicinity of the engine, you can see that line that goes across the center of the engine. It goes right down the middle. Well, that line actually goes down the entire car. It's carried throughout the entire vehicle, including in the interior, which I'll show you in just a minute. Next up, a couple of other interesting traits back here. Now, obviously, you can see the brake lights on either side. That's no surprise, but there's also this red strip of light that goes down the entire middle of the back of this car. The Bugatti people told me that the designers refer to this as the kiss goodbye, since if you ever try to race a Chiron, this light will give you a kiss goodbye as you see it pulling away. Next up, you can see another important item worth mentioning back here, and that would be the wing. Now, the wing has several different positions that it can be in. Right now it's in kind of its normal position, which it's in a lot of the time when you're driving along, providing some downforce. Now the car has various drive modes, which I'll get to in a minute, and they sort of change the position of the wing. For example, if you're in handling mode and you're on a racetrack, the wing changes to provide more downforce, better for going around corners. If you go into top speed mode, it lowers to make the car more slippery and more aerodynamic, and the wing can also make itself into an air brake. So when you slam on the brakes at high speed, the wing shoots up and basically provides drag to help you slow down in addition to the regular brakes you already have. One interesting quirk I like about the wing, you'll notice that the wing is made of carbon fiber just like the rest of the body of this car, but take a look when it's up there is even carbon fiber underneath the wing. Now mostly when the car is parked the wing is down so you probably won't see that, but Bugatti decided to put extra carbon fiber under the carbon fiber just in case someone parks it with the wing up in order to ensure that it always looks perfect. That is impressive attention to detail. Also cool, the brake light is kind of interesting. It has this sort of arrow design on the top and they light up when you press the brakes or you put on the turn signal and they blink and it's kind of a cool look that's kind of a departure from your typical car. Interestingly, the third brake light in this car, the one in the middle, is hidden. You would never know that it's there, but when you put the brakes on you can see it. It's just a thin little strip of brake light right above the Bugatti logo in back. And on the subject of the far back of this car, we have to talk about the elephant in the room or at least the elephant on the bumpers. For all Chiron models sold in the United States, Bugatti has to install these big black plastic bumpers in back in order to meet the United States federal government five mile an hour bumper safety regulation. You will not see this on any other Chiron sold anywhere else in the world, only on the US cars, and I suspect most US owners will remove them the moment they take delivery. Of course, one other item we have to mention is the sound, and so now we will take a listen to the Chiron. move on to the inside of the Chiron and you start by opening the surprisingly light door. It is made of carbon fiber after all. The first thing you notice down on the floor next to the seat is a little keyhole. Well that's where the speed key goes. If you want to go the car's full top speed you have to actually put a key in that keyhole in order to activate the highest speed mode. So where does that key live? Well actually it's right next to the keyhole. It's marked Chiron and you just take it out and you pop it open just like a regular Volkswagen or Audi folding key. You stick it in there and then you access top speed mode, which gets you up to 260. Now, interestingly, you can't just stick the key in and go to 60. The car also does a check of oil cooling everything to make sure it's ready to go that fast and then you're able to go the full 260. If you don't stick the key in and enter top speed mode, the highest you can get up to is 236. Now, beyond the top speed key, you might be wondering exactly what the regular key looks like in the Bugatti Chiron, and well, it looks like this. It's just a key, but it's wrapped in leather, and it says Bugatti on it, and it's very nice, and it only has lock or unlock buttons on it. It's worth noting that this car it has a proximity sensor, so you never really have to take the key out of your pocket, which is good, because there's no little hoop for you to put this on a keychain. I guess Bugatti feels this doesn't belong with the keys to lesser vehicles. One interesting item, when you get inside the car, you don't have to take the key out of your pocket, but there is a little key storage area to the right of the steering wheel. Put the key in there, and then that's a place where you can keep it while you're driving along. Of course, when you're ready to get out of the car, you'll want to make sure to take the key out of that key storage area, lest someone come and steal your Bugatti. Now, if you look over there next to the top speed keyhole, you also find a few other items, one of which is the parking brake. You push it or pull it to turn it on or off, pretty simple. There's also the memory setting for the driver's seat. You can set various different memory positions so it goes into the position you most desire. It's not particularly unusual. Next up, moving on to the door panel over on the driver's side. It has one especially cool quirk to it, and that would be the way 
the window switches and the door locks sort of stick together. It's a very cool look. You got the window switches on top, you push and pull and roll the windows up or down, but then below that you have the lock and unlock button, and when you just sort of take them in as one whole piece, it's a very clean and cool look. Less interesting is the mirror controls, which frankly just look like regular mirror controls for a regular vehicle. You put it on L, you adjust the left mirror, you put it on R, you adjust the right mirror, you can fold in the mirrors and you can turn on the mirror heaters. And yes, you can fold in the mirrors. Here's what it looks like when you fold in the mirrors on a Bugatti Chiron. Next up, moving further inside the interior, it's hard not to be truly amazed with just the physical materials in here, the leather, the aluminum, the carbon. Nothing is pretending to be anything else. It looks like carbon, it is. If it looks like aluminum, it is. Everything feels and looks so nice. And when you touch everything, there's just this solid feel to everything, precisely as you'd expect from a $3 million car. But back to the quirks, one interesting item is just how many storage cubbies are inside this car. There is one storage cubby in the driver's door panel, and then a second storage cubby in the driver's door panel. Same on the passenger side, two storage cubbies in the door panel. There's one little storage area in the middle in the center console, and then there are two other interesting ones. One is the glove box. In order to open the glove box, you push a little button, and the glove box pops open. The glove box is cooled in this car, so if you want to bring a drink with you in your Chiron, you can keep it cool in the glove box. Also interesting, there is a little storage cubby underneath the center control stack with the switches. And check this out, this car has double paned glass for more quietness, which can sometimes interfere with phone reception. But if you put your phone in that little storage cubby, and if you have it connected with Bluetooth, the phone will actually use the antenna in the vehicle, which is hidden inside the windshield for better reception as you drive along, thus negating the problem you might have with reception in the double paned windows. Now, another item you might find interesting when you get inside this car, you look around, you'll notice there's no touch screen in here, which I imagine will upset a lot of people. I've paid $3 million for a car and I don't even get a touch screen. Everything has one of those. Well, the theory here is Bugatti wanted the interior to be timeless. They knew this car would be special in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, and they also knew any screen they put in today would look outdated and terrible in just a few years. Look at the navigation system from 2005. So instead, they tried to keep the interior relatively clean of stuff like that that would date the car and make it look old. It's the same story with the speedometer in the middle of the gauge cluster. It's not an electronic screen like it is in so many other cars. Instead, it's a traditional analog speedometer, which is designed to be timeless and to still look good in 40 or 50 years when everybody laughs at the screens of today. Next, we move on to the air vents, which are rather interesting. For one thing, they're rather small, although I've noticed that when you turn on the car and blast the AC, the size of them doesn't really matter. It gets a lot of air conditioning in this cabin. It's a relatively small interior. More interesting is the way they move. You can move them from side to side pretty easily, or you can move them up and down using this little dial in the middle, which is sort of unorthodox air vent movement, but that's how it works in the Chiron. It's also worth noting one other interesting item the Bugatti people told me, this car has the first airbag in the world that shoots through carbon fiber. If you get in an accident, the airbag on the passenger side shoots through carbon fiber to make sure you aren't injured. It's the same story with the side impact airbag in the seats. The side airbag will shoot through the carbon fiber of the seats in order to protect you in an accident. It's the first airbag ever to do that. Next, we move on to the center control stack, and specifically the center control stack dials, which are among the most interesting I've ever seen. Here's what I mean. Right now, you can see these dials are just climate controls. All four have a different function. The one on top adjusts where the air comes out. The next one adjusts the fan speed and the amount of air. Then below that, you have the dial that changes the climate control air temperature. Then the last dial turns on the heated seat. And if you tap the little silver button below the seat icon, it toggles between the driver and passenger heated seat. But there's a hidden trick. If you hold down that button that changes between the heated seats, well, check this out. Now suddenly every dial is completely different. The top dial now shows how much much power you're making in that given moment. The next one shows your current speed, the next one shows your engine RPM, and the last one shows what gear you're in. Move a dial to change it though, and it goes back to being a climate control instantly, but after a few seconds it goes back to showing the other items you were displaying. And here's the cool thing, you can choose a lot of different items to display in the center dials. There's a gauge cluster screen that I'll cover in more detail in a minute, but for now if you go into that screen, you can configure the dials in the center to display all sorts of items. For example, I've selected cruise display 
display and now they're showing trip statistics like average speed and fuel economy. But if you want to turn them back, just hold down that button on the bottom and they go right back to being climate controls again. Next up in that same area, another interesting item in this car is the gear lever, which operates in sort of an unusual function. Right now it's in park. If I pull it down, that puts it in drive. If I move it over to the left, that puts it in neutral. And if I move it over into neutral and then push it down, that puts it into reverse. Then the gear lever sort of goes back to the middle position. Interestingly, at any moment, you can just press the top of it and then you're automatically in park. Two other interesting items in the gear lever. One is that the top button, which says press to park, for some reason they've chosen a lowercase p for press and an uppercase p for park. I'm not really sure why, but it's one of the mysteries of the Chiron. The other interesting thing about the gear lever is it just falls so perfectly into your hand. It is tailored specifically to fit exactly in your hand, and that is exactly what it does. Now, next we move on to the C-bar, or the Bugatti line in the interior. Now, remember that line on the outside that sort of resembled the C, and I called it the Bugatti line? Well, they have the same thing in the interior. Remember when I told you that this car sort of has this line going down the entire middle of it? Well, that is also true in side and it's this Bugatti line. It sort of makes a C shape in the interior and sort of bisects the interior directly in the middle, carrying forward that styling cue from the outside. A couple of interesting things about this little line in the middle. One is that it even bisects the rear window, meaning the rear window is split into two separate pieces. You have a left rear window and a right rear window, which you won't see in a lot of other cars. But the most interesting thing about this line in the middle is that you can turn it on. If you move the light switch in the ceiling to the correct position, this light can turn on and you can drive around at night with this light sort of illuminating the middle of your car. Bugatti says this light is the longest uninterrupted interior light conductor in the entire automobile industry and I don't doubt it. More importantly, it's just a really cool piece. It brings in the exterior styling into the interior. It looks really cool and this is the only car I've ever seen with anything even similar to this. Also also interesting when it comes to lighting is the light switch itself. It's very beautiful, just like everything else in this car. I've never seen a light switch that looked so nice and so upscale. Next up, it's worth noting that everything in this car can be individualized. You'll notice, for instance, that the back of the seats say Chiron on them. They told me, you want to make them say Doug? You could pay for that, no problem. Same story with the passenger and driver's side footwell. They also say Chiron stitched onto them. Once again, you want to make it say Doug? No problem. Or whatever you want it to do. I asked them, do you turn down anything? What if someone wanted something crazy? They said, we pretty much do what our customers want. We try to figure out a way to make it work and to make our customers happy. A couple of other interesting items. This is what the sun visor looks like in a Bugatti Chiron. Notice there's no visor mirror on the driver's side. That's because if you're driving one of these, you don't need to see a mirror to know that you look cool. But the passenger side sun visor does have a visor mirror, which is a nice thoughtful touch. One other interesting item, when you don't put a touch screen in the center, you don't have radio controls in there. So you might be wondering, how could you possibly turn on the stereo? Well, go down the center control stack to the very bottom, right below the gear lever, and there is a simple on-off button. Press it, and that turns on the radio. Press it again, and that turns off the radio. It is just that simple. Of course, that isn't the only way to access the stereo. There's more to it than that, which I will get to momentarily. First, I want to talk about the steering wheel. At the base of the steering wheel, you see it says Chiron, which is a nice touch, and right above that, it says LC, which stands for launch control. You put on launch control, you put your foot on the brake, and the car sort of readies itself, and then you have about three seconds to get your foot on the gas, let off the brake, and take off launching. Now, one interesting thing about launch control, Bugatti says they refused to sign off on this thing being ready to sell to customers until they could do 200 launch starts in one day and have the transmission take it and not have any problems with heat or braking or anything else like that. Our next interesting item on the steering wheel is the one that says engine. You press engine and of course that turns the engine on. Press engine again and that turns the engine off. Now the other really interesting item on the steering wheel is to the left and that would be the dial that switches between modes. Well, what kind of modes does a Bugatti have? The standard automatic mode is EB. You use that for around town driving. Move it to the right and you'll see a little highway that's called Autobahn mode. It sort of lowers the car a little bit, and you use that for the highway. 
At the bottom, there's one with a checkered flag on it, which is handling mode. You use that if you're on a racetrack. Those are the three main modes you want to use if you're in this car. Then, of course, there's also top speed mode, which you can get into. And then over on the left, there's one other mode, and that's called lift. If you want to take this car onto a flatbed or put it on a car hauler or something like that, you might need a little more ground clearance. So you put it over in lift mode, and then it tells you that it's going to lift mode, and you can see the car actually rise up a couple of inches to allow it to go onto a carrier. The other interesting items worth mentioning in the vicinity of the steering wheel are the stalks that come off the steering wheel. On the left, you have the turn signal stalk, which operates like a regular old turn signal stalk, no problem, except you can see this little on-off thing in the middle. You can move it from on to off. Well, that turns on and off your cruise control. It is unlabeled. It's just sort of a hidden Easter egg. And that's not the coolest thing about the cruise control. That comes over on the end of the stalk. You see a little plus minus button. That allows you to change the cruise control speed if you want to increase or decrease your cruise control speed. It's the same story over on the wiper stock. It looks like a normal wiper stock and you can change it one, two, three, four. That sets the speed of the intermittent wipers. But there's also a little up down arrow at the end. That's your dimmer switch for your gauge cluster. If you want it brighter or dimmer, you just tap those arrows and it does what you want. I find this especially cool because instead of sticking more buttons and dials for these functions elsewhere than the interior, Bugatti just sort of saw a place they could put them and kind of keep them out of the way and keep the interior decluttered. It's a really cool idea. Now, speaking of a cool idea, I mentioned this car doesn't have a center touch screen, but it's worth noting that it does have an infotainment screen and it's inside the gauge cluster. There are several different menus to go through, so let's do that now. You control the screen with buttons on the steering wheel and most of the menus are pretty typical. This one shows trip details, for instance, like top speed and average miles per gallon. Next up is the Bugatti tire pressure monitor, which is of course fancier than a normal cars. There's also a stopwatch for racetrack use. This screen also contains a navigation system and stereo control as you might expect. Something you might not expect is this, an octane change feature. This car is only programmed to run 1500 horsepower on 93 octane fuel. So if you put a lower octane in, you're supposed to go in here and change it, which limits power to 1100 horses to prevent engine damage. And yes, even in a Bugatti Chiron, you can set a speed warning that beeps at you if you're going over a certain speed of your choosing. Now that's the screen to the right of the speedometer, which is the one you'll primarily use for most vehicle functions, as you can probably tell but there's also a screen to the left of the speedometer, which is just as much worth noting because it has some important characteristics. You can see the outer edge shows your RPM. As I rev the engine, you can see the tachometer climb. The inner edge shows your PS, which is basically a European equivalent of horsepower. It shows exactly how much horsepower you're using at any given time. Or you can switch that screen to show your precise engine RPM at any given moment, right down to the singles digit. So if you want to know precise whether the engine is turning at 1,246 RPMs, well, I guess you can find that out. The other interesting thing I like in the left screen is if you open a door, it shows a top-down image of a Bugatti with the door open, and that is a pretty cool image. It isn't just a generic car like most other vehicles. It is unmistakably a Chiron. One last item, open the door at night and you can see this car projects Chiron onto the ground below, which is a cool little touch. And so that's the Bugatti Chiron. Own. Now for the scary part, I'm going to get out on the road in a car that costs more than my house and my neighborhood. But first, I had to get gas. Yes, I took the Bugatti Chiron to a Petro-Canada gas station, and I filled it up next to a Mitsubishi Outlander and a Dodge Journey. If you've ever wondered how a Bugatti Chiron looks when it's just sitting in a gas station, well, here it is. Next, I drove the car, and I spent about an hour in it, mostly at high speeds. I didn't get a chance to film many exterior shots of the car driving, though, so I'm going to loop in some shots I did take of the car at lower speeds, even though they don't really match up to my driving experience, just so you can see what the Chiron looks like on the move. I'm a little nervous. Wouldn't wouldn't like to pretend that I'm not. That's sort of the reality of this. The first impression you get when you're in one of these is just you're like, oh my god, I'm in one of these. Like that's that's the first thing you're thinking. You look down at the steering wheel and you got the Bugatti logo there, and you're like, what has my life come to that I'm driving this car? It's almost hard to sit behind the wheel here and not think to yourself, this is absolutely an incredible thing. You think about it, I'm behind a Tahoe, this thing is worth you know, a hundred times that. And so you're, that's something that you can't not be on your mind unless you are just so rich that you don't care. And even just tapping the throttle, you can hear the engine start to do its thing. And you just know that there is so much more there if you want it. <laughs> that was just 
just a little tap at the base of the throttle and floored it for just a brief second. It is tremendously, incredibly fast. Absolutely, unbelievably fast. I'm gonna try that again. Yeah, I mean, the thing about it is there is some trouble like if you sort of ease into it, but if you drop your hammer, the car knows what you want to do and it absolutely does it and it does it incredibly fast and it does it with so much force. One thing that I find interesting, this car is a little bit quicker than the 918, which I also drove, um, but it feels, the 918 felt tremendously stable, but this feels more, um, Luxurious isn't the right word, but it just, it doesn't, the 918 felt more like a crazy go-kart and it was loud and nuts and you're going whatever you want. This feels like you could just cruise at about 300 miles an hour doing whatever you wanted to do. It's amazing to me that I'm just, I can just then drive it along on like a nice smooth road and it just feels like a car. I really do feel like you could kind of take this on a road trip if you want. There's a ton of room here. I've got, I mean, I'm 6'3", I've got at least three inches between, you know, my head and the ceiling. I got room in, in the footwell, everything, and I can put my seat back further. It, and it's a comfort seat. It's not one of those crazy GT3 sport seats where you want to die. You could be lulled into forgetting that you're driving a Bugatti. You could just think to yourself, yeah, I'm in a car. I'm just kind of cruising along. But then you tap the throttle and you remember everything. Sitting at a stop, a stop light, stop sign, it feels, it feels nice. You hear the motor, obviously, it's a giant engine. It's right behind you. But other than that, it sort of feels like a car. You don't hear much outside noise. The double pane windows kind of take care of all that. And so you really, it ends up being almost sort of a luxury car experience when you're stopped or when you're going low speed. The transmission is really quick. Um, the, shifts are, the shifts are immediate. When you're in just regular drive mode and sort of going at a normal pace, um, you don't feel them at all. Uh, there, it's a dual clutch and obviously it's a very, very smooth one and it feels just fantastic. It's actually quite surprising. Full throttle, if you roll, it's, it, <laughs> you're in, you're in lose your driver's license territory before you even realize it. It is unbelievable how fast this thing is and it does it drama free. And that's probably the most unbelievable thing about it. It's just absolutely, you floor it, and of, of course it's going 100, well, at speed that I shouldn't say, kilometers, 100 kilometers. Of course it's going that fast, that's, that's what it does. And the funny thing is, you're not gonna reach even close to the car's capabilities. Uh, driving in any sort of regular traffic or normal scenario. Boy, the handling, it grips and grips and grips. You feel like you could go a lot faster than this. The handling mode that, that does tighten up the steering, boy, it just grips like crazy. I mean, I shouldn't be going that fast. And there's no body roll and you really feel like you can kind of do just about anything. There's absolutely no feeling at any point of, you know, loss of control or anything like that in this car, which is almost hard to imagine something with 1,500 horsepower. I mean, you drive the Demon and you floor it in that thing and you're like, hang on. This thing, it's more like, it's just very stable. Just the, uh, what you, the thing you think about, I think, when you're driving this car is engineering. That's the thing that I really am thinking about. It's just, they've engineered out all the, the scariness and everything and only left you with the good stuff. And so that's the Bugatti Chiron. Even though this car is absolutely amazing, incredible in every way, some car enthusiasts aren't all positive about it. Some people say it's too heavy, there's too much engineering, it's too expensive, there's not enough emotion in it. But I think people mostly say that because they know they'll never have the chance to own one, they'll never have the chance to drive one, to sit in one, to even see one perhaps. But I'll tell you something, I've driven one and it's amazing so you can cut that crap out right now <laughs> anyway now it's time to give it a Doug score starting with the weekend categories and styling the Chiron is beautiful but there's a lot of controversy about the styling it falls just short of perfect and it gets a 9 out of 10 acceleration there is no argument it easily gets a 10 out of 10 handling is excellent among the best but the Chiron is a bit heavy and the steering is just a bit light and it gets a 9 out of 10 fun factor is obvious it of course earns a 10 out of 10 and the same is true for cool factor an easy 10 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 48 out of 50 that 
prioritize the very best, meaning the daily score is make or break. So we start with the daily categories and features. The Chiron is loaded, but it's low on modern high-tech equipment. In part, that's by design, but this car has no radar crews, no blind spot monitor even. It gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort is impressive, especially considering what it is. It gets a 5 out of 10, which is a great score for a car like this. Quality is top-notch. This is one of the nicest interiors I've ever seen, but I'd seriously feel long-term reliability and ownership costs, so I can't give it more than a 7 out of 10. Practicality is next, and it's surprisingly drivable and usable, but it attracts massive amounts of attention, and the cargo room is hilariously small, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Finally, there's value. This one will start some arguments, but here's the thing. There's nothing else like it. Nothing that combines the best supercar performance with the best luxury car materials and craftsmanship. There will be depreciation if the Veyron is anything to go by, but if you have the money and you want the ultimate car, this is that. Still, $3 million is an insane amount of money, and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a daily score of 25 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 73 out of 100, which makes it the new Doug score champion by a mere single point over the 918 Spider and the AMG Wagon. Here's a comparison with a few other modern supercars I've tested and you can see the Chiron is simply the best. Then again, it had better be given the price tag. But even when you floor it, even when you, oh God. Kip, what are the odds of that? <laughs> He's not, he doesn't have his radar cut out. <laughs> that would have been a story.